So, I mean, it was a trip to say the least to know that I had a child out in the world and that I wasn't there. I mean, that's like the worst feeling you could possibly imagine. Just like knowing that you're like, I could hear him when I'd call Kareen, I'd hear him cry. And it was just, you know, pretty electric feeling. But then again, I was shooting a lot of cocaine all day, every day. And I just got in my first riot. You know, I don't know what I expected. I don't know if I expected like some wrestling belt or something, but nothing really happened after the riot. It was just kind of awkward, you know, <laughs> because we didn't get caught. But the thing is, is a lot of people got stitches. You know, like a lot of people had to get medical attention and, and the cops just didn't even. They're just like, whatever, you know, like they didn't catch us in the act type thing. And the cops at San Bernardino jail aren't really that carefree. I don't know. We just got lucky. I guess maybe it was just that particular cop that was working on duty that day. But, you know, I continue to shoot coke. And the problem with that, even on the free world, <clears throat> is that eventually you drift into psychosis. You know, you start getting really paranoid. And people start getting really weird. You know, um, I don't think it was this particular place that somebody did this. I think it was when I did meth in, in county jail one time, but it's the kind of thing where like, you know, you, you get high with people like on meth or, or any sort of upper in, in jail and they'll come up to you and they'll be like, Hey man, are you mad at me? You haven't talked to me in five minutes. So I'm, I'm thinking that like, maybe I, I don't know, maybe I said something. I'm going to go tell the cop I got to go later, bro. And you're just like, what the fuck? You know, um, things get weird in, in, in jail settings when you're on uppers. Heroin is made for, for prison. It really is because it's the ultimate escapist drug, but meth or cocaine are just totally out of place in a jail setting, you know, people will draw, people will write letters. I remember, I don't know why I keep going back to other stories, you know, but one of my favorite novels is Last Exit to Brooklyn by Hubert Selby Jr. He wrote Requiem for a Dream. And it's not like the easiest novel to read. And it's, it's a deep novel. And I remember being in jail one time with this guy and a bunch of meth hit in the middle of the night like two in the morning and some came in with like a quarter ounce or something and we all started tweaking all of us the entire unit you know nobody was eating everybody was just stacking trays uh the cops knew i mean they'd walk by and do their their rounds and we're like all up playing poker and shit three in the morning for like a week straight but i remember this one guy i mean he wasn't he wasn't the sharpest tool in the box. Let's just say that. But I, to be fair, I didn't talk to him enough to know that, but he didn't seem that way. I mean, he had like, you know, Aztec warrior tattoos on his eyebrows and shit, you know, he had like no eyebrows and just like Aztec symbols. I mean, that's cool. If you want to join a prison gang or something, but you know, for employment and I'm not look, I mean, I'm covered in tattoos myself, but I don't know. The Aztec eyebrow tattoo thing, that's, that's a whole different, another level of I don't give a fuck. Shh. So misbehaved. But so this guy, he's like, hey, man, do you have any, do you have any books? It's all spun out. And I was like, yeah, um, I can give you this. Last exit to Brooklyn. He's like, what's it about? I'm like. And what do you say, what do you tell somebody that the last exit of Brooklyn's about? Well, it's about trannies and hookers and gangsters. And that's exactly what I said. He's like, I'm in. And he like grabs it. And it was so weird. He was like the intellectual gremlin, you know? Or he's like, well, the species may be something that's been ratified by several generations of cyclical despair. Remember that guy? I don't even know if I did the voice right. but he like turned into the intellectual gremlin and I gave him last exit to Brooklyn and like four hours later, he hands it to me. He's like, 
like fist bumps me. It was like a dangerous guy, you know? I'm like, you read the whole book? He's like, I'm like, huh? What'd you think of it? He's like, well, it felt like an indictment on the hellacious landscape of urban decay. I'm not sure if I got it or not. I'm just like, what the fuck? He like just started spouting off this like pseudo intellectual shit. It's the weirdest thing ever. He didn't talk like that either. And I mean, verbatim, that's not what he said, but it was something, it was like he understood the book and read it in like four hours. It was bizarre. You know, I remember another time we were up for like a week in county jail on meth. Same, same place. This was in um, Santa Barbara County Jail years ago. And this guy came up to me and he's like, he's like, hey man, do you know any, you know any fags? And I'm like, I, I, no, I don't think so. I got a few possibles. Definitely suspect homies and shit, but nah, why? He's like, whoa, <laughs> you know, I was thinking, I was thinking that we could dress up like fags, man. And we could like rob a fucking bank or something. And I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean by that? He's like, you know, wear fag lipstick and, you know, rob a bank, but they think we're broads. You know what I mean? I was like, damn, dude. And he'd been up like one day, you know? That's what, If that's day one, what do you think he's going to be like day nine? <laughs> Who knows what kind of weird shit he would say at that point. Um, well, the point is, it's just, you know, being in, in jail with um, with uppers, any uppers, doesn't matter what it is, is always a recipe for disaster. Because everyone gets paranoid, but fucking conga lines occur, sex rides crack off. I think we could rob a bank. You know, shit like that. And shooting cocaine was no different. I mean, you know, with meth, you can do, in jail, you could do a couple lines of crystal meth and you're going to get weird, you know, because jail's weird to begin with. It's just a weird, think about what it is. Well, you've been bad. We're going to lock you in a building with other bad people for, what do you think? Jane, you paying attention? Four months? What do you think about four months in a building? Just sign that piece of paper and we'll do it. Oh, look at the attorney. It's a good deal, Mark. Okay. Guilty. And that's it. It's, it's a, um, it's a vicious cycle. And, you know, when you're on amphetamines, it amplifies the weirdness. That's just weird, you know? You start seeing how weird people are, you know? Um, and so with cocaine, it takes a little more than a couple lines. But the thing is, is I had a bunch. I mean, I had so much that I was just giving it away to people. You know, it was like, I felt like we were in a music video or something. We we're just like slashing powder cocaine and we we're just like, yeah. It's like we were like making, you know, money rain. It was that kind of thing. And then, of course, I had, we got in a riot, which was quite an experience. You know, I felt like I'd gone to an amusement park and like survived the scariest ride or something. The riot ride, you know. And you go on, it's just a room that just like tilts. Everyone just beats each other up. That's the riot ride. And I felt like I'd been on that. And then on top of that, I'm running this unit and I just have, I have lampshade. Mm -hmm. You know, that weirdo dude, you know, the guy that futs, fucks it, futs. He futs his mattress. Dab motherfucker. The guy that fucked his mattress. Lampshade who was in there for felony stalking. <laughs> and then we had Mountain Man. And I don't know, he was, he was cool. I like him. Hope I run into that guy again someday. He was cool. He'd be a cool guy to like go on a fishing trip with, you know. Hey, Mountain Man, remember when we were in the county back in 2019? I could never forget that, brother. 
let's kill this squirrel. <laughs> and just like eats it. <laughs> no, I don't know. It was weird though. People that live up in the mountains are weird. And then I had Doug, which was my homie. He was cool. And then I had the the the, the dope fiend that shit the shower. So I had I had, you know, I had a very um eclectic mix of social white rejects. So I kept doing the coke and I kept doing the coke and I kept getting weirder and weirder. And I thought I started getting on this trip thinking that if I called Karina, there was probably some operator in my mind. I thought there was probably some operator that was like matching the frequency of my voice high compared to not high. And some radar was like some red thing on her screen was going to start blinking. Like he's high on cocaine. He's been shooting cocaine. Search him now. You know, like, in my mind, I really thought that that was like a plausible scenario. That I was going to get busted, that they were going to know that I was all gacked out on coke just for talking on the phone. So I stopped talking to Karina for a few days. And then I'd call her and it's, it's like, and I'd, it'd be like, I'd be in trouble. Like, where have you been? I have been worried sick about you. I'm like, you know, and I'm like trying to change my voice, which makes me, if, they, if anyone was listening, it would make it sound so much more obvious that I was on drugs. I'm like... <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. I just got a cold. I got a cold. I got a cold. How are you? How are you? Like a concerted effort to try to like confuse them. But Karina was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And I'm just like. What the fuck is wrong with you? You. She's like, you're shooting drugs. Click. She actually did hang up on me right around that time because she was mad because she knew that I was getting loaded. I mean, I don't blame her. She got, when when she found out she was pregnant, she quit drinking, you know, and that's admirable. And and then I quit just to, out of respect for her, just to like, like, you know, I, I, she's such a bad alcoholic. And I mean, I'm a bad alcoholic too, but it was relatively new for me. So it's really hot in here. Hold on. I'm going to open this door. It's hot. I'm back. I am back. Sorry. Wow, it was. It was like drenched. Ooh, it's hot. Like five in the morning. My landlord probably thinks I'm on that. He's got to. I'm always pacing and like talking about stuff and like loud and I'm like, you know. Probably thinks I never sleep and I never leave the house so he, he probably thinks i'm selling meth out of the house or something I'm sure he does anyway so um what ends up happening with the coke is i mean i do it until the end karina's upset because she 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 just kind of knows that now yeah, the fucking birds uh, she kind of knows, you know, she knows I'm all, I'm, all, I'm all fucked up and, and she got clean and, and why, why should I get to do drugs? And I'm like, cause I'm in fucking jail. That's why. God, we've talked about this. When I'm in jail, I can shoot drugs enough, <laughs> you know, um, that's just my junky way of rationalizing it. But, um, so around this time, this old, this older guy, not, I don't know, he's probably, it's probably 50, you know, I'm 34. That's old to me, 50. And he comes in and he's like this really clean cut playboy looking guy. Looks like a trust fund baby, you know, kind of guy that wears uh, like, you know, thong um, flip flops, you know, tong flip flops or whatever. Like the thing goes between their toe. That's him with like the little, like, you know, he put the sweatshirt over, you know, he's just this prissy guy. Oh, hi, how are you? And I'm just like, what the fuck? What are you doing here? Well, they've got me on an amphetamine case. I'm like, a what? Uh, an amphetamine case. An amphetamine case? You're for a crystal meth? But that's right, the amphetamines. Mm-hmm. They got me on a conspiracy and all and these bastards. I'll beat them. And I'm like, Oh, what would you get caught with? So, so what he told me is that he had got, he was on a conspiracy, one of these bullshit conspiracies that the feds do. He got caught selling an eight ball of, of crystal meth. 
that's three and a half grams. In in LA, I think that's like I'm not a tweaker, but I think it's like thirty or forty bucks. Pretty sure it's cheap, you know. And and that's a lot. Like an eight ball, you know. I mean, it's a lot, but it's not a lot. To, oh, it's a lot. It's not a lot, is what I meant to say. Um, you know, I guess it'd be like a lot to do at one time, but for charging him with federal distribution for it, it was it it wasn't very much. I mean, you know, an eight ball. Like the kind of shit you boof when you're in a fight with your girlfriend or something. You're like, fuck you. I'm sticking his eight ball in my ass, bitch. I'm so high. And then you jerk off for a long, long time. So, um, you know, they had offered him five years in prison. And he was like, this was like a really, really like, you know, kind of like, just like I said, like a sn- like a prissy guy. I'm not going to take five years. That's fucking bullshit. I was just to use it. I mean, he was one of these guys. He was, he was a trust fund baby. <laughs> Spot on with that. And he would just do crystal meth in motels and debaucherous shit with hookers. I respect it, you know. Um, he was just doing his thing. Part of that world, especially when you're like Mr. Prissy Pants like that, like, ooh, I don't know. I don't know if I want to meet you behind the IHOP. I heard that minorities park there. You know, it's like one of those kind of guys. And just from like being in that scene, he sold meth or like middlemaned it once. <laughs> like they had, his case was corny as fuck. Like he middlemaned meth one time and they charged him with conspiracy to distribute crystal meth. And they wanted him to rat out his connection. And so he was looking at five years and he's like, oh, I won't accept it. We're going to trial. So he goes to trial and gets 15 years. <laughs> These guys get fi- like, I mean, sorry, I laughed about that. I mean, it's actually really, really sad and, and a, such an abuse of power on the Fed side. I mean, 15 years for an eight ball for something that you would boof if you got in a fight with your partner. 15 years. You've never been in trouble before. And that was his story. It's like, yeah, I've been sentenced. I'm just waiting to catch the chain to go to prison. And there I'll write my memoirs about being a trust fund baby. What did that lady say to me? I've had a very interesting kind of life. A 902 and out life. If you know what I mean. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I still this day, I don't know what she meant by that. The show 902 and out, you did you grow up rich? I don't really know what you mean by that. Somebody commented, they're like, it meant she was a slut. 90210 life is code word for super slut. I've never heard that before. And I've known some super sluts. Am I? No, I ha- I'm just kidding. I heard about them though. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, this guy, I forget what his name was, but he seemed like a mild mannered guy. But he, he he had a double life. He was a compulsive gambler. By this point, the cocaine had allowed me to kind of prop myself up. So I had the broken rib thing going on, and I was the repa. But they would all, all the paisas would play poker in the day room. And I'd always watch them, and, and just one day I got the itch because I love poker. I sit in, and I win. I'm in like $8, $9 in commissary or something. And then I'm just hooked and that's it. And so I go there, I'll go, I'll go to my bunk. And I look like, of course I do the lip thing because I'm shooting Coke. I'm like, shoot the Coke and then go back and just play poker all day with broken ribs and like just be in so much pain, but I'm just such a gambling junkie that I had to do it. Now this guy, he sees us playing poker and his eyes just brighten up. He's just like, seriously it was some crackhead shit he'd like he'd like his takes his reading glasses off rips his you know jail uniform open no but he runs over there and he sits down he's like i want to play a hand and then we nicknamed him tecato tecato means junkie in spanish because this was the biggest gambling junkie i've ever met in my life have you ever seen the movie um dirty work um 
there's a scene, you know, Chevy Chase always has like a cast on because he's always getting beat up by bookies. He's like, they're like, how'd you go against Rocky in Rocky Four? He's like, nine to one odds. Couldn't pass that up. He always has a cast on. This was that guy. Takato is what we call him. He was horrible. He was horrible. Like his, his mom, he was like a trust fund baby. So his mom would send him like hundreds of dollars and then he would gamble it all away on the first day. And then you'd like see him like selling his shower shoes and shit and i'm like dude you have to wear that to go to chow you can't sell those he's like no 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 no. fuck that i'll 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 trade it for a buy-in and then i'll i'll get my money back i don't even have a problem with gambling see i can stop when i want i'm like wow dude (laughs) this guy and like he just got he was one of those guys that would be annoying you know he became a liability he'd go up to like a black dude and be like hey hey black you know because he'd hear people call white guys wood and he'd hear people call paisas paisa. You know, like you see, like say you see me in your different race, you go, Hey, wood. I'm like, Oh yeah. What's up? I'm a wood. Like, Hey wood. Um, do you guys have any like wood merchandise? Like pecker wood beanies, anything? No, Nope. We don't have that. No. You know, they ask you stuff like, Hey, um, you know, it's your guys' TV day today. Um, I really want to watch Judge Judy. Do you think we could make it happen? And, you know, and then you make concessions to it. So you can call a Paisa. Hey, Paisa. You can call a Southsider homie. Hey, homie. You can call a Peckerwood a wood. But you don't call black dude a black. You don't go, hey, black. <laughs> you know, it was like really weird and i think he got that because we called the you know everyone else by their name so he just assumed well i calls him like a sees hey excuse me black and you're like some big burly black guy would be like hey what the fuck's that supposed to mean black what the fuck is that hey man uh, you gotta talk to your people man this dude's a fucking straight dump truck and i'm like yeah god Takato, you cannot call a black guy black That was the guy's name is Robbie. Hey, Robbie. He's like, hey. I'm like, he's a really nice guy. He's here for domestic. But he's he's cool. He's kicked back. Oh, damn right I am. You know, and so this guy, Takata, was just, I'm just trying to illustrate, like, the amount of liabilities I had. So I had Takata, like, going up to everyone and being like, and he would try these elaborate fucking Ponzi schemes on people. He'd go up to people and be like, oh, excuse me, um, black? Oh, yes. Um, let me have a moment with you. Um, yes. Um, I need exactly 11 soups right now. See, I'm by, I'm trying to buy into a poker tournament and I need a total of 24 soups. I need 11 soups. Mm-hmm. And, um, if you give me 11 soups, I'll give you 12 soups back. Does that sound generous enough? They'd be like, fuck no, I'm not doing that. You know, if you want 11 soups, you're going to be 22 back. How's that? White. He's like, oh. But he'd always be running these scams, you know? And then he's one of these classic guys that would rob Peter to pay Paul. So I had Takato. I had the Dope Fiend. I had um, Mountain Man. And I had Lampshade. So one day Lampshade goes to, he. I don't know if I guys told you this story. I, think, I don't think I did. I think I told Karina because she watched one of the videos the other day when I was first talking about Lampshade. And she asked me, she goes, well, what happened to Lampshade? Like, I'm curious to know what happened to Lampshade. And I'm like, and then I told her, right? So I think I told her, not you guys. But so what happened with Lampshade is he went to court one day and me and Doug were like, we got to look through this guy's shit. Like, I mean, we just got to know, like, we we just, I have to know what, like, because he was always drawing something and you go up to him and he's like, like hide it like act like we couldn't see that you know oh and then he'd like just go back to fucking his mattress or flexing in the mirror whatever this guy was just really really weird so he goes to court and like so we finally we were like taking bets on what it was going to be you know doug's like i bet it's a list of people he wants to turn into you know love pillows or you know high-end lampshades or whatever the fuck it was i didn't know what it was i think my guess was that he was writing like some girl that he had captive somewhere in some well or something you know 
we go to it and it was even weirder than what we <laughs> would have expected. So he had been drawing like a blueprint for the house that he was going to live on, in, on his slab, on his plot of land. So we look, we look at this piece of paper and there's just a drawing over and over and over again, like a blueprint style drawing of this house. And then we start reading because he wrote something. And it, I swear, I swear, I put this on every, oh, my son, this is true. He wrote, he wrote, bubble, bubble, bubble. Are you my baby bubble? If I wasn't a bubble, then I wouldn't have a baby. And if a baby wasn't a bubble, your bubble would be bubble too. The bubble, bubble, bubble song. Bubble goes wow. Bubble goes pop. Bubble goes wow. I was like, what in the fuck is that? You know, who writes stuff like that? Now, it's pretty close to what it said because um, because I've told this story so many, because it was so fucking weird, you know? And then you'd have like these like cartoons of bubbles waving and shit. And we're just like, wow, that guy smokes a lot of PCP in New Hampshire. Straight up. Like that's, it's bizarre, right? So around this time so and then he comes back from court and you know we'd fuck with him periodically and be like bubbles go wows and he'd be like <laughs> and just start laughing we went whoa whoa that guy's fucked up so we kind of left lampshade alone i mean you know we'd all say that that guy's capable of a mall massacre no doubt at all about that I mean, for real, this guy was just fucking on one. So again, so now I got to Kato too, and he's just, he's absurd. He's absurd. You know, I hear him on the phone with the old mother. Um, they're going to kill me, mother. I chose goddamn Baltimore again. You know, because he was in the sports gambling. He played poker. Once in a while, someone open a blackjack table. It's a common hustle in jail or prison. And they tilt the odds. I, like a push loses, shit like that. So the odds are tweaked a little bit so that the house has like a way bigger advantage. And it makes it really... Um, sorry, guys. I really need a cigarette. Hold on. This is what happens when I record something at like five in the morning. I get all distracted and shit, and I'm sorry, but at least I'm getting you something, right? So, you smoke gay. You like girls gay. So, around this time, this other guy comes in, and he's an, an, an Egyptian prince, supposedly, right? He's not. He comes in, he's like, hey man, I'm an, I'm a, he was kind of like, he was, he had taco quality. Hey man, I'm an other. And he said it with pride. Like this guy was stoked that he was an other. You know, he was going to get like embroidered other fucking scarves made for all of the other others. And the others consist of him and like some Ewok looking Asian dude, you know, just the oddest group of people. And this guy was Muslim, and so his whole story is that he was like some, he was some Egyptian prince, he got caught in an international ecstasy ring, and I'm like, why are you not busted by the feds? You know? Why are you just in San Bernardino County Jail? And yes, the dorm that we were in was outsourced to a lot of federal inmates, but remember, county guys came in there as well. So, and this guy had a state case, he didn't have a fed case. And, you know, he's, well, I got caught with 30,000 ecstasy pills. I'm getting seven months. I'm like, oh, that checks out. But he wasn't white, so I couldn't check his paperwork. But he came in while I was in the midst of shooting an ounce of cocaine. And remember, I paid two hundred dollars for this thing. So he comes in there and he's like, um, he's he's hey, uh, he's a very taco esque, like I said. He goes, yeah, hey, um, hey man, uh, yeah, I heard that you got some yayo, man. That's the shit that I love. I'm just going to keep it 110 with you. 
that's the shit that I really love. The Coke, though. Yeah, I'll buy it, whatever. I'm a millionaire, so. And I was like, oh, shit, a million. I was like, well, yeah. I was like, I'll give you three grams for a thousand bucks. How about 1200? And I was like, that, yeah, that works too. So he ends up sending me 1200 butter. He sends Karina 1200 bucks. And, you know, I'm all stoked. I'm also all coked out, but I, I'm thinking, you know, I'm providing for my girl while I'm away. I'm a good guy. And 1200 incidentally was the amount of money that Jose had given me that I got burned by Midget Man or whatever the fuck his name was. It's not his real name. I know his real name, but he's still doing his thing. I'm not going to put him out there like that. But um, so I got 1200 bucks. And then after that, I ran out of Coke. And then I went up to him and pretty much like tried to like, you know, bully him into giving me some of the Coke back. And it worked. Hey, and I'm not even a bully. It's just that's a testament to my drug addiction. Okay, sorry, the birds, and I'm all over the place. So, okay, so I run out of Coke. I get a little bit from the Egyptian prince, or I don't even remember what his name was, but the next day, right at the day after I run out of Coke, so right, I, I wasn't, I didn't sleep for about three days, and Nico had just been born, and I was also kind of energized by that whole thing. I was just really excited that I had a son in the world, and then I got a night of sleep because I remember the next day I woke up to this. I woke up to a South Sider that came in. Now, there's a weird phenomenon that you'll run into in prison and in jail where like Armenian dudes run as South Siders. I've never understood it. They're nothing like South Siders. But oh, oh, hey, what's up, dog? I'm a homie. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Armenia X from space, dog. You know, <laughs> nice to meet you, dog. I'm a homie. Okay, whatever, right? So this guy comes in and he's like that. He's an Armenian Southsider. What neighborhood are you from? Oh, uh, Beverly Hills, dog. With Uncle Popeye. He's an essay, dog, and that's why a homie. They're never from a neighborhood, you know. So. This guy comes in and, and he claims he's outside and you see this happen a lot too. Guys come in and they claim that they're the, some black guy came in. I so this is true too. I, this, I have to say this stuff's true because it sounds so fucking made up. A black kid, a black kid. I'm not talking about like a really dark Mexican kid. I'm talking about straight up black, talked black, was black. Comes in and he's like, He's like, hey, uh, hey, dog. Uh, yeah, I'm a, uh, I'm a paisa. And I was like, what the fuck? What do you mean? Oh yeah, I run paisa. Uh, my stepmom's Mexican, dog. Yeah, I'm a paisa, dog. Yeah. Just, what the fuck? So this black guy was running paisa, and so this Armenian dude comes in. Anyway, make a long story short. The way that it worked at this place is that we switched off depending on which be bed you were in. You know, like every like 20 rows had to do cleanup and it would like constantly shift. And it was basically races because we were, the beds were kind of clustered by race. So it was the Southsiders day to clean. Now the problem with being a Southsider is in this particular unit, you'd only get like two or three, you know, um, you get like two or three Southsiders there at a time. So it was not a good car to be part of. You know, so I remember I woke up in the morning and I went and I called Karina. Now this new guy had come in as well. There was a lot of guys like kind of cycling in and out of that place. This guy had come and he was like a bona fide state prison convict. He'd done a couple terms. He was with it. And he, he knew how to carry himself. And we hit it off right away. He respected the fact that I was attempting to work out even though I had broken ribs. So I'm on the phone with Karina, which was always hard because I'd have to stand up and anyone that's ever broken your ribs knows that just to stand is, is excruciating and so i'm on the phone and this this new white dude comes in he's like hey yo man hey come here come here this shit i need you dog and 
I go and all of the pieces are surrounding this Armenian South Sider. And, you know, and I, I like run up and I'm like, what's, what's, what's the problem? What's up? What's going on? And they're like, and Lewis is like, well, this guy does not want to clean. This is not good. I'm like, uh, you know, I was like, hey, man, you got to clean. He's like, no, nah, dog, fuck that. Fuck that fool. Fucking South Side, dog. Fucking South Pole, fool. Like, no, dude, that's a clothing coach. Fucking South Pole, dog. So what? I'm not cleaning, dog. I ain't no fucking bitch, fool. I'm fucking Armenian, fool. Just saying stupid shit like that, right? So... They're like, well, it doesn't really work like that. This is like a democracy and we're all equal and we all have cleaning days. So you have to clean. He's like, nah, no fucking way. It's disrespectful. You're even trying to make me do that shit, man. No, I'm going back to sleep. Fuck that. You know, his eyes were squinty because he was all tired. So he goes back to his bunk and I'm just looking at the Pisces. They are sal uh, salivating like wolves. You know, you can literally, they were like licking their lips. And I'm just looking at the South Star. Like, and he, this guy was such an idiot. He like looks at some guy next to him. He's like, these fucking idiots, man. They try to make me clean up, man. Fuck them. You know, fucking stupid Pisces, man. Fuck. He goes back to sleep. Puts the blanket over him. And I was like, oh, man. It's going to, that's just going to end really bad for this guy. Like, you know, there was like one other Pisces there. This really overweight guy. You know, I felt bad for him because he was one of those Southsiders that was so big. It was just hard to take the guy seriously. You know, he just, he looked like the Kool-Aid guy. He's like, he's like, yeah, what up, dog? I'm from fucking East LA, dog. But he like couldn't even move his arms. He looked like, remember Kirby, the video game? Where it's just like, yeah, he looked like that. So, of course, he saw that. They were like approaching the other south side. And if, it, it, normally, what you're supposed to, do, of course, there's 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 solidarity, there's camaraderie. That's not what he did. He just pretended like he was sleeping. He looked. He was like, oh, and he just went right back to sleep. So these Pisces go, and he, this guy has a blanket over him, and they just start punishing him. It's probably about three of them, and they're hitting them. And the way that those blankets were, there's like this white kind of cloth. I don't even really know how to describe it. It's, it's more like beige. And as they're beating him up, I mean, they're hitting him. They hit him 40, 50, 60 times. And every time and they're just hitting him and he has the blanket over him and he's screaming for them to stop. And they just keep hitting the blanket over and over again until the blanket starts getting really bloody. Yeah, it was really actually, it probably doesn't sound as bad as it was, but it was actually really violent. And, and I remember the guy pulled up his blanket and there's so much blood on him that it kind of just like, there's like a thumping sound. Like it, it like it thumped out of him. Like when he lifted the blanket up, there was so much blood underneath of it. And he saw it and he's just laying at the end of his bed and he started vomiting, you know, out of just, I don't know. And he was vomiting and crying. And then the Pisces like pretty much told him he had to go. And he, he walked with his head down and he ate. Hey, shh. He went and he checked it. He checked in. He rolled it up. Um, it just covered in blood. Now that particular time, about a hundred cops just rush in there and they zip tie the entire unit. Hey, shh. they zip tie the other, the entire unit and they take us out to the recreational yard. That's what they do when they search our our unit. And thank God that I had just gotten, I had just finished the coke, but I had my syringe chilling like in an envelope. That's where I would always put stuff in, in, in jail settings. I, my dad sends me a lot of letters. I have friends that send me a lot of letters. So it looks like I have a lot of legal work and I would just stuff it in an envelope and then just have this huge stack of stuff. They'd have to go through everything individually to find it, but it's still a source of concern when they're hitting the unit like that. So we get back and um, I'm, I'm sitting in my bunk, you know, I mean, when you get back from your from the unit getting raided like that everything's in a disarray you know they take everybody's extra linen you know people use extra uh, blankets to make pillows because they usually just give you an option you get two blankets you can use one as a pillow or you can have two blankets and it gets cold enough at night where you really need to so i would always choose the pillow you know and i just got used to it and now i don't even sleep with pillows and karina thinks it's the weirdest thing but when we get back um, you know, I, people from downstairs can yell up to us. So somebody asked for me, they say, Hey, Packerwood, Packerwood. 
and one of the other white dudes runs down and, and he goes, Hey, he's asking, the guy's asking if anyone has a shot of coffee. I had coffee and I was like, yeah, I got him. So I, I, I make him like a decent, a decent size bag. You know, I probably had like a $10 bag of taster's choice. That's about, you know, this big. And I probably gave him about half of it. And, you know, taster's choice was like the Cadillac coffee at this particular place. So I give him the coffee and you just hear, Hey, thank you, dog. Yeah, no problem. I'm in bed <clears throat> about an hour later. Paisa comes up to me. He's like, Hey, the wood gave me this to give to you. He gives me a piece of paper. I was like, Oh shit. He's probably going to ask if he can like borrow a bag of coffee. And I open and there's a gram of heroin inside. Hey, shh. God, they're annoying. I know this video Te on a technical level, it's not my best work, but we're not done, are we? So, hey, shh, they never found the syringe. So now I had a gram of heroin. I was just like, what the fuck? This guy that I had given a shot of coffee to had come in with like five grams of heroin. And just because I was nice and didn't ask questions and didn't ask for anything back and just gave him half a bag of coffee, he blessed me with a gram full of heroin. I was, and I, and I had, or a gram of gram full of heroin. He gave me with an entire gram, like a street gram, like a 1.0 of heroin. And I was, I was ecstatic because I'd been shooting so much Coke. Nico is just born. Heroin was like, you got, where? you guys need to really stop and try and do a video. I'm not going to buy you bones at the grocery store anymore. Yep. You get some, They're, they become obedient when they hear that shit. Hey, shh. So, anyway, yeah, sorry. This is what happens. That's why I try to say it's so loud here throughout the rest of the day. That's why I like I always record late at night so that they just shut up. Um. So <laughs> I start doing a bunch of heroin in there, and this uh, another South Sider comes in. And so, you know, I do that whole gram probably in like two days. I'm just, I'm in complete bliss. I'm, I'm, I'm going up to people I don't even know, like Pisces that don't speak English. And I was just like, yeah, let me tell you about challenge here, dude. Look at these. And I'm like showing like baby pictures of Karina or that Nick, of Nico that Karina had sent. Um, she had sent that. I, I should, I should mention that as well. She sent, my dad mailed me the first picture that, you know, existed of Nico right when he came out and uh, that was quite an experience to see your own baby especially through a photograph when you know that they're out there and, and that against your will you can't see them it's, it's a really shitty thing and so you know I'd get high and I'd show everybody my photos and everything and this new Southsider comes in while I'm, while I'm getting loaded you know I'd done that gram and then I asked the dude if I could buy two more and he charged me a hundred bucks. So I got two more grams. So I had three, I was just pigging the fuck out. I'm a pig anyway, when it comes to heroin, but I am pigging out. And this, 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 this fat outsider comes in and he, he gets in the cell net or the bunk next to me. So we're talking one day and, and he's telling me, you know, he's, he's on federal probation and he's facing a violation. And he tells me that I go, well, what's the violation for? He's like, oh man, it's so fucking stupid, dog. It is the stupidest shit I ever heard in my life, dog. This lady says that I fucking forcefully grabbed her tits, fool. Why would I even do that, fool? If I was gonna grab anything, I raped that bitch, dog. She's fucking stupid. I'm like, rape the bitch. What the fuck are you saying? Rape the bitch. It's like the fourth time. That's what happened. The dog was crying at the door. That's what was happening. So, you know, as soon as I hear this, I'm like, now for if it was a white guy, I would have just taken off on him right there and then. But there are rules, and there was big homies at this particular institution. So I couldn't just take off on this guy because I knew that he was a fucking rapist. But there's also no way I was going to let that slide. So. On top of him being race, rapist, as soon as he got there, he's like, yo, dog, I'm taking the keys, fool. This is my fucking unit now, fool. My name is fucking Hector the Seventh, fool. I'm here to take the fucking unit, dog. So he takes it. Now, it was easy to take because there was no competition. There's nobody else there. 
So in, in literally there was like one other Southsider and he was like some 20 year old kid that was like bald and had like one hoop earring. I don't think he was like a real gangbanger, you know? And so in, in right when, when, when the rapist dude got there, he's like, he's like, Hey dog, uh, I, my name is Hector Fu and, um, Hey, I'm the new rapper. Hey, I just want to tell you that I'm here to, you know what I mean? Play by the rules. I respect you. I respect what you got going. Sometimes maybe we could eat together, eat some ch chicharrones. I, you know, uh, uh, I just want you to know that I respect you because you're a shot caller too. Maybe when we're out of here, we can do some international drug sales, dog. I got an uncle for, and I'm just like, who is this guy? So when I find out about the rape allegations, what I do, there's a bunch of Southsiders downstairs and I send them a kite and I say, hey, one of your guys says that He's in here because he fondled a woman's breasts. He's a sexual predator. You got to get him out of here. Said if he was my people, I would I would have already done it. So I get a note back from them, and they're like, "Hey, we got to check with the big homies. They're kind of sensitive to the situation. There's no other homies in there, so you might have to be the one to take care of it, or at least your car." And I'm like, "Okay, fine. You know, whatever. We're kind of like allies with the with the South Siders anyway." Then we get another kite back and it says for us to move on him. And I'm, I so now I'm in the same predicament as before. Um, I have to pick somebody to put work in on this guy. And there's a really good shot that I'm going to get caught because this guy, like I said, is morbidly obese. So it's going to take like a multiracial hit squad. You know, there's going to have to be like, like the Asian Ewok, the Kato, the, the black dude, Robbie, all of us just on one crew, just smashing the sex offender out. And it's just, what do they say, dog? It's an allegation. It's not even true, though. That's fucking disgusting. I would never do no shit like that. I don't need to, fool. I'm fucking attractive, dog. I'm fucking attractive and I like women, dog. So what? You know, and I'm just like, man, we got to get rid of this guy. So now it was on us. And I'm looking at my crew of misfits, Dakato, Dope Fiend, Mountain Man, Lampshade. You know, and then there's me with a broken rib. So what am I supposed to do? I don't even know. And so I send a message and I go, hey, um, we're still trying to plan it off. And I get another message back saying, if you don't handle it by 7 p.m. tonight, it's like two or three in the afternoon then we're going to handle you guys. I was like, what? So now it was either we had a move on this guy or they were going to get us. And we will get into this in the next story. Like, comment, subscribe, check out patreon.com slash Ryan Leone. Check out the Paul project, paulnarcanproject.com. You can still get into the raffle 12 chances to win. We're giving away $15,000 in prizes and it's for a good cause. Please consider it. Sorry this video is all over the place and short. I just wanted to get something to you guys. Um, I'm trying. I appreciate you, and um, we'll definitely see you next time. Palabra.